This is the ugliest, most ridiculous, most insane F1 car that has ever f one It's called the Tyrrell P34 and in case you hadn't noticed, it don't got four wheels, it's got six. Houseway? Well, lest we forget that at its core, F1 is just a billion dollar science project where you innovate or you die. Because Delta is harder to come by than frankincense and my F1 engineering buffs would gladly sell you their grandmother for even a split second worth of lap time. F1 teams stay bending rules. And because the only thing that moves faster than the cars is the regs, F1 has birthed some monstrosities down the years. Machines that look more Mad Max than Max Verstappen. And the P34, well, it just might be the wackiest of them all. So go on then, what's its story? Let me catch you up to speed. The year's 1973 and a team called Tyrrell have walked the championship. Looking for a suitable car to win the Formula One World Championship with? Well, Ken Tyrrell can probably help you there as well. We want Jackie Stewart behind the wheel. Now, I wasn't around in 73, but I hear this Jackie Stewart fella wasn't half bad when it comes to all this F1 malarkey. Being a three-time champion as he was across two decades and all that, the only problem was that Sir Jackie retired at the end of 73. I think the major reason is that I've retired from my family, for the children and for Helen. But without Sir Jackie, 74 and 75, well, they were tough times for Tyrrell. There's the clan of Ferrari in the south and the mighty McLaren in the north, with better aero, bigger engines, began to impose their will on the rest of the field. Fast forward to the 76 season and enter stage left, a mahoosive change in roulage and regular chance. The front wing was to measure no more than one and a half meters wide. 1.5 meters left not enough space, however, for all of your mechanical bits and the width of your standard issue Goodyear tires. And so they were left wholly exposed to the elements. And this made the car more dragging. That's tech speak for slower in a straight line. To solve for this, Tyrrell's lead buffing had a eureka moment. Why not try and make the two front wheels as small as possible? But there are no free meals in engineering. For aero, two small wheels at the front, brilliant. For braking and turning speed, tiny brakes and a microscopic contact patch, very bad. But if two wheels up front doesn't cut the mustard, then why not us go with four? Oof, surely not. Well, hear me out for a second, because this thing kind of makes sense. The buffins at two or figure two wheels up front would have a bigger rubber footprint than one of the regular Goodyear's. And this meant more traction on turning. Similarly, you'd have four brake this versus two. So in theory, more stopping power. So the theory was weapons grade, but in practice, was it any good? Well, if we're being honest, it was pants. Perhaps it's still a little premature to say categorically that the six-wheel car will be the car of the future. To start with, the brakes on the little tool that could didn't work. You see, brakes work best at cool attempts and keeping the front disc cool on the P34 was harder than solving nuclear fusion. The brakes were prone to locking up as well and that would shorten or lengthen the wheelbase depending on which of them locked up. Not exactly a predictable handling dynamic then. But with the 10 inches, at least the tyre deck was good, right? Mm. That was rubbish as well, because the bite-sized front wheels would do more revolutions than the bigger rears, which would give you an even deck across the six. This wasn't helped by Goodyear, who after agreeing to make the smaller tyres to spec, point blank refused to develop them at all. And because the wheels were so scrawny, the drivers couldn't even see them from the cockpit. And when trying to hit an apex with molecular precision at a gazillion miles an hour, being able to see your wheels might be quite important that. As a workaround, Tyrrell built a transparent porthole window through which the drivers could see exactly where their tyres were. Still not ideal, that. And to boot, it was mightily underpowered against the might of Ferrari's V12s. Tyrrell's six-wheeler with its piffly V8 engine was giving up as much as 40 brake. Uncle Ken prayed to the racing gods for a trick engine courtesy of Renault's turbo project and that this would help bridge the power gap to the Ferraris. Sadly for Uncle Ken, his prayers fell on deaf ears and his plans for a trick engine amounted ultimately to nothing. But hold on for a second. So Jackie, can I borrow you, mate? Of course, seven, of course. Only 7% of the people watching this are even subscribed to the channel. <laughs> you me. Bonkers, right? So Jackie, what's going on there, mate? They can't watch the bloody computer. And I know that you're free time champ and all that, so Jackie, but how did you feel once you'd subbed? Then I was complete. Wow, that critical really. You'd be surprised how important it is. So if you do those things, the chances are you're not going to go far wrong. To say that driving this thing is difficult is to say that climbing Everest 
is a bit of an uphill struggle. And Jodie Schechter, Tyrrell's replacement for Sir Jackie. Well, he loved it. Apart from the quirky handling, the chameleon wheelbase, the bendy suspension, the brakes that didn't work, not to mention the uneven tire wear. He, he really didn't love it at all. Not even for a second. And why would he? It was a bit rubbish. But that would all change at the Spanish Grand Prix that year, where Schecter, still skeptical of the P34, was still using the old four-wheel Tyrrell, and he qualified 14 for a whole two seconds off the pace. Schecter's teammate, Patrick the Pellier, in seeing the potential upside in the P34, persevered with it. He drove it at the Spanish Grand Prix, qualified in four. This put the rest of the field on notice and Schechter, of course, was quick to change his tune. And three races later at the Swedish Grand Prix, this would pay dividends. The track was notoriously understeery. The P34 would come alive. Because for all of its failings, the fundamentals of the concept were sound. More tyre at the front meant better turning, higher minimum speed. And because the 10 inches were tucked in behind that bluff nose wing, it would be slippier through the air. Enough to stay with the scary Lecoq Ferraris of Lauda and Legazzoni. But could it deliver a victory though? Could it ever? Schechter smashed out a pole for the first time ahead of Andretti with teammate De Pellier qualifying fourth. This boded well. Andretti though would jump Schechter off the start, forcing Schechter to settle for second in the early running. Midway through the race, our Tyrrell pairing of Schechter and De Pellier had worked their way up into second and third respectively. But as Andretti powered away from the back to a seemingly inevitable victory, our Tyrrell boys need a miracle. But then it happened. All of a sudden Andretti's Lotus in plumes of smoke. His Cosworth engine had breathed its last breath. Handing the victory a 1-2 and vindication to our six-wheel Tyrrell P34. And while sadly for the P34, it wouldn't go on to win championship after championship. But you know what, for me, that's lost in the roundings. Because what the six-wheeler is, is a cheeky nod and a wink to innovation in F1. The P34 is the forefather to genius design philosophies that leveraged active suspension, ground effect, the double diffuser. And this matters because the P34's one two in Sweden, well, that was one for ingenuity, one for cerebral brawn over financial muscle. It's for the engineers who laugh in the face of convention, for those who dare to be different, those who dare to be great. For this, is the story of the Tyrrell P34. This is the story of F1. And if you like that one, you'll love this one on the most iconic photos in all of F1 history.